in the Christian life, Christ and the Gospel are not one element. They are the element. When the Christian doctrine and the Gospel is truly proclaimed as it ought to be proclaimed and men reject it, what they need to know is that they are not rejecting a religion. They are not rejecting certain principles. They are rejecting a person. Know this. You are not rejecting a religion. You are not rejecting a set of principles. But I want you to know what you're doing. You are apathetic towards the one person that God loves more than all of creation combined, His Son. When you reject Christianity, know this, you are rejecting the One for whom the entire world was created. Know this also, that God will deal harshly with you for your arrogance against His Son. Know this, that maybe in your humanism, maybe in your youth, maybe in your foolishness, you've set your heart as stone against God. And none of what I'm saying causes you to tremble. Like a young man once said, I'm not afraid to stand before God. I'll face Him and my fate. And the old preacher told him, young man, you will melt before God like a tiny wax figurine before a blast furnace. Your proud heart demonstrates nothing more than your own stupidity. Creation testifies against you, and you yourself know that the very God you are rejecting is the one before whom you will stand. So I want you to know that when I deal with these texts, there are two groups of people here tonight. There are people who are here because they love Christ, and in loving Christ, they are seriously concerned for pleasing Him and for growing in holiness. There are others here who care not for holiness. And the reason why they do not care for holiness is because they simply do not care for Christ. And that is a very, very dangerous place to be. As we look at our text, we see something. That ten different times in this short text, there's a word that appears. It's the word abide. And I have said over and over that the only way that the Christian can be fruitful in the Christian life is to abide in Christ. Now, if I tell you this, it's very important I explain to you what that means. You know, preachers are famous for telling people what to do and then not telling them how to do it. I remember one time as a young Christian, this man, he preached for something like an hour and a half on the necessity to walk in the Spirit. And it was a fabulous sermon, and it proved to my young heart that I needed to walk in the Spirit. The only problem is he never told us what that meant. So I went up to him after the service, not intending to wrangle. I was, I was happy with what I heard. I thought it was very edifying. I just thought I'm a very immature Christian. I don't have a clue what it means to walk in the Spirit. So, sir, I went before him and I said, sir, I, wow, that was just wonderful. I see that in the Scriptures. I need to walk in the Spirit. But sir, I don't know what that means. And so I have told you that the only way you can be fruitful in the Christian life is to abide in Christ. Now what does that mean? Now first of all, the word abide is not that complex in Greek. It's meno. It means to, to remain, to abide, to stay. Now when we bring in the metaphor of a branch, you can see that a branch must be connected vitally to a vine in order for that branch to continue with life and to even bear fruit. So somehow you and I must be vitally connected with Christ. If you are truly a Christian, and I don't say that lightly because most people in America who call themselves Christian are not Christian. And some of you who call yourselves Christians are possibly not Christians. It's very important to understand. Let me put it this way. If you consider yourself a carnal Christian, you're lost. You're just lost. Do Christians sin? Yes. Can Christians fall into grievous sin? Absolutely. Can Christians live a continuously carnal lifestyle without fruit? Absolutely not. And so if you are a true believer, you are vitally connected to Christ. He is the vine. You are a branch. He is the head. You are the body. We have many metaphors like that to indicate this unique position we now have with Christ. Another is, the Bible talks oftentimes in spheres, locatively. For example, you're in the sphere of Adam. 
or you're in the sphere of Christ. So if you're genuinely a Christian, you are a branch and you're vitally connected. But here's what we need to understand. This position that we have does not lead us ever in the New Testament to being passive. But it always promotes a zealous application of this truth. A desire for this truth to be worked out in our life, to become manifest. And let me use a word that many people are afraid of. To be experienced. That it's an actual reality. Abiding in Christ is, is through continuous dependence on His Word. Constant submission to His Word. Persistent spiritual imbibing of His Word. Now look in, look in verse 7. Fifth, chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in Me, and My words abide in you. Now look at verse 10. If you keep My commandments, you will abide in My love, just as I have kept My Father's commandments, and abide in His love. I know that you live in a culture where you can go into every Christian bookstore and find 1,000 books on 10 steps to do this. I'm sorry. Quick fixes here and there, microwave Christianity, instantaneous this and that. No, my friend. You have been given a book which I dare say most of us despise. You see, we're always wondering, where is the power? Or you see a man or a woman who seems to be fruit-bearing and full of power and zeal and you want to find their secret. The problem is there is no secret and when they give you the answer, you're not going to like it. What is it? I have no wisdom or understanding of my own. I do not know how to walk from the bedroom to the bathroom apart from the Word of God. This world is a minefield full of danger. I have no telepathic ability to discern where all the mines are hidden, but I have a map. I do not know how to discern the things of God, but I have been given truth in Scripture. I'm sorry, my dear friend, if you were waiting to find out something that would really just be brand new to you about how to abide in Jesus, I'm sorry. But it is this first and foremost. He has, for foremost, He has given you His Word. It is just us going into the Word, going into the Word, going into the Word, going into the Word. Not even seeking to be transformed by the Word. Just recognizing the importance of the Word and living in the Word. And eventually, without us even knowing it, we begin to take on its characteristics. Do you see that? How much... You say, let me give you an example, a rather just vulgar, trite, common example. Let's say that you come to me and you have a big spot on your forehead that's just a bloody mass. And you say to me, Brother Paul, I've been to every doctor in the world. No one can figure out why I have this. Could you please try to pray to the Lord that He would give you wisdom with regard to why I have this on my forehead? And I say, well, I'm no doctor, but sure, I'll pray about it. But I decide one day to be even, even practical and I decide to follow you around for 24 hours. And I notice that... that at one o'clock in the morning, the clock strikes one. And you get up out of bed and you hit your forehead against a brick wall one time and go back to bed. And then I watch, it's two o'clock. You get up precisely at two o'clock when the bell strikes and you hit your forehead twice on a stone wall and go back to bed. Now I notice as you go through the day, every turn of the hour, you hit your, you hit your head against a wall that many times. At the end of 24 hours, I come to you and I say this, look, I'm no doctor, but I think I figured out your problem. If you will stop banging your head against a brick wall every time the clock strikes the hour, I think your head will heal. You say, that's absurd. I say the same thing to you. You neglect the Scriptures. I'm sorry. 